thought we would have a workshop just to get a little more information out about the high school. We, we had uh, last week uh, surveys done for students, staff, and parents. So we um, shared the Google Doc with you that will be the presentation tonight, just so if you're having trouble seeing it up there, you have it on your screen. Uh, so just a few opening comments. Uh, as we kind of go through this process, in developing the high school's hybrid plan, we looked at um, health and safety first for everybody across the board, K-12. Um, but then what was the special considerations for the high school were really the, was really about the K-5 and how the priority to try to get them in K-5 as much as possible and how that trickled up and impacted our other grade levels. So, um, we have data from the superintendents um, across York County, and you were shared some of that information, mm -hmm. just the high school information yesterday or last night. Uh, we do have the elementary and middle school information that we will send out at a little uh, different time. So when you're looking at that, keep in mind that that does not talk about the elementary, their elementary. So while we look you know, well, we'll go through some of that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And as you look at that, just know that our elementary is very robust in um, as you're looking through the, the K-12 data. So we're going to have some information from, well, from everybody that's that's sitting here. We're gonna start with the principal's report. Hi, Linda. Hi. Good evening. I'd like to start by thanking the school board and uh, Audra and Sue for their support during this really difficult time. You've had to make some really tough decisions and uh, every one of those decisions uh, probably has some people who agree with it and some people who disagree with it. So it, it's, it's hard to do and I understand that. I'd also like to thank Assistant Principal Allison Kearney, Assistant Principal A.J. Dufort, and Director of School Counseling, Nancy Samard, who spent literally their entire summer working on plans for this year and as well as many weekends. And the 30 to 40 hours they spent just putting this data together for you today. So thank you very much. Uh, our number one priority for Noble High School is to keep the environment safe for students and for staff. I'd like to share with you some of the things, some of the safeguards we put in place this year. Uh, some of them you've heard about, but I wanted to just uh, review them a little bit and tell you how they're going. In the building, the ventilation system was inspected and updated. Um, we have directional signs all over the place on the floors and in the hallways. We have, I think, 80 or 90 hand sanitizer stations in the building. Uh, our benches have been marked for designated sitting areas. Allison, thank you for that. Um, the auditorium, the lecture hall, the AGM have all been labeled for places to safely sit. The BGM has been converted to a cafeteria and almost all the classrooms have been rearranged. We have some pretty strict routines. We have students following, which um, it actually surprises me that they are following them for the most part. Um, in the morning, the students come in, get off the bus, use the hand sanitizer on the way into the building. They're then directed to three separate areas to sit and wait for school to open. They either go to the AGM, the cafeteria, or to the auditorium. All students um, are checked for masks when they get off the bus and when they enter the building. And if they don't have one or have left one home, they are provided with a mask. Students are very uh, slowly released from the waiting locations before going to block one, so we don't have all the kids in the same place at the same time. Between classes, students are slowly released from their classes and they go directly to the next class so they're not mingling in the hallways. Restrooms have push button lights that students use to indicate how many people are in a restroom. Uh, they're limited to usually two or three students in each one of the restrooms. At lunch, our teachers accompany the kids into their uh, three separate areas, either the mezzanine, the cafeteria, or the B gym to eat lunch, and they're slowly released at the end of the lunch. At the end of school, students are released from their classrooms by small groups to help avoid kids being in the same place at the same time. 
We have been very impressed with the students and the use of hand sanitizers. Um, they're boarding and unboarding the buses uh, in a very controlled manner. And they're complying with the mask rules, the lunch rules, and the restroom rules. Uh, we've got a few exceptions, but I would say 99% of the kids have been following all guidelines. So we feel like this plan is working. I spoke with uh, nurse Amy Creighton today, and she said, as of today, we have sent home six students in grades eight through 12 and requested they get COVID tested due to the symptoms presented at school. This does not account for the many more who have stayed home and have been tested either because they have been sick, have been exposed to a positive case or have traveled. We've had no positive COVID cases at the high school and the two middle school cases have not resulted in any spread of the virus among our students. So I think that's really something to be proud of. Sorry, can you just repeat that? Zero cases at the high school and two cases at the middle school, yes. which were basically taken care of. Through yes, they were contained. So we have a quarantine right now with our with yeah. our, one of our teams. Yeah, that's amazing. It is. It's Do you have any questions about any of those things? Um, Joe, I'm going to just step in really quick just to be sure that Travis and Linda have the information that you're looking at. So. Um, Ali sent out an email earlier today, or actually not long ago, or Audra did, I guess, yep, and shared a document that we're going over. I just want to make sure that you can access it. You can just listen if you want to, but it's nice when it's in front of you. Um, Go to finish. I'll share the screen. I just haven't done that yet. Yep. Um, I'm just making sure I've got Lynn and I have Joanne. I'm Nancy. It's like I feel like romper room, and I see. I don't see Denise on it, but that's okay. She well, might. I do have it. I think. Welcome to the hybrid world, Miss Austin. I know. <laughs> it's been hybrid for a while. There's Travis. Okay. <laughs> All right. All set. Yeah, I just wanted to be sure that. This is the one that's called full copy. Yeah. Full copy. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's interesting. I know you're not showing here, but that doesn't mean a thing. Oh, there you she are. Is. There she is. Oh, okay. I was just. I had to shut down. Okay, so good. All right, sorry. Ready? Yep. So now we'd like to review um, a hybrid plan that you approved at the beginning of the school year. I know that's a long time ago. You may not remember what it looks like, so Allison's going to share that again with you. Sure. So I'm at this point going to present my screen uh, so that the board members at home can hopefully see that. Travis, we're going to use you as our guinea pig. Let us know. Board members at home, can you see this? Yeah, can you see it? I'm not seeing it yet. Yeah. Yes, I can see that. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And this is the document that we are all on. And within this document, there's a lot of things that are linked that will open up other documents. And we'll do our best to sort of open and close those as we go through. Um, also, feel free to ask questions along the way. This is really like we're giving you a ton of information, but ask the questions as you go. Yeah, and sort of again, just to cycle back to what Audra had mentioned is that this is really tough uh, for everybody who's dealing with this everywhere. And I think that so the unique piece for um, the high school is that we were unique to begin with, with five grade levels. Um, most high schools have four, and then with the middle school sharing our space, that puts five grade levels in three phase access to the building. So we had to get very creative with the plan. So that's why we wanted to review that, let you know how things are going, and then some ideas that we have for next steps for um, things we'd like to do. So if you wanted to take a look at, um, again, a review of what we're doing right now, this is what we call 1.0. Um, hybrid learning schedule. And so we sort of began this and this was an iterative process so that can evolve as we kind of go through to see how things are going, knowing that none of this is anything that any of us would have ever imagined doing. It's always hard to picture. So we're living and breathing this now. And so just to review, um, for us, hybrid being out of the yellow framework is true whether we're yellow or green due to the required measures from the governor mostly pertaining to safety and spacing of kids at six feet. Um, so for us on Monday and Tuesday, all of our kiddos, eight through 12, are remote. 
And that is because the middle school is in our building those days, having their in-person days. And it's been actually really nice. We are here in the building while the little guys are in here, so it's very neat to see how much smaller they are than our kids. <laughs> um, but they are, they, are, they seem very well behaved, they're very compliant, so there's just this, this very big difference. So there's a couple of So I'm like, wow, they are, they are tiny, um, <laughs> but they seem, especially in our big building, so that's been really cute to see them. They definitely were in awe for the first couple of days. So that's been, that's been neat. So um, on those days, they're here, so, so we have made space for them. So our staff and kids are at home, and we have what we are running we're calling synchronous, so we might be using these terms synchronous and asynchronous, and um, they're kind of a mouthful, but you can also think of it, I'm sure you're familiar by now, but um, for other folks, together time or less than together time is the other way. So um, on so Monday- I, I was actually gonna ask for, so synchronous is considered not just in person, but in person slash online, Basically, like this meeting, so yes, correct. would be a synchronous. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Synchronous is would be like if, if I said, "Hey, Travis, why don't you go work on this um, on okay. on your own and, and let me know when when you're done and pop on for questions later." Okay. Or yeah. we record the meeting and someone listens to it later. Or right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So real that's time right. versus not necessarily yeah. in real time. Live yeah. real time, whether it's in person or behind a screen someplace, versus um, self-paced. Okay. Yeah. So you can do this sometime on Wednesday, or we're all together on the street 8 a.m. on Wednesday. That would be synchronous, so in sync, right? Um, versus a little more independent. So all the kids log on at 8 a.m. synchronous uh, for their block one, and then that course ends. They stay together, synchronous, uh, and then their block two begins at nine, all together, synchronous. Uh, to get creative, which we had mentioned, we're running four blocks, um, which means all day one classes this semester. And the reason for that we'll kind of get to, but the in-person stuff, we knew we couldn't run an eight-block day because that's way too many transitions through the hallways. So again, that safety piece. So we deal with our day one classes, semester one, our day two classes, semester two, and that prevents us from ever having to run an eight-block day. Um, so what that means, though, is that AP courses... Um, that was a little tricky for those because we didn't want kids to not start their AP class if it were a day two until January 22nd and all of a sudden they have the AP exam in May and we didn't want the other to be true where my AP course begins now but it ends in January and then I have a gap before the AP exam in May. So we created special courses which we began by calling AP Enrichment. We've revised the name to AP Extension. Um, to allow basically a continual process for the AP so they don't have that sort of gap part. So that's where that clicks in until the 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock slots for those kids, and those are synchronous. So if I have an AP class that meets day two, block one, I am in that class section on my computer from 10 to 11, et cetera. And they have to be separated out by those days for different blocks like that, because some kids take numerous AP courses, so we couldn't have them all on top of one another. How are the kids, um, so if somebody has an AP class that's scheduled for this semester, mm -hmm. and then they have one for scheduled for next semester, but they're starting it during that enrichment time, or whatever you, whatever you call it, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still work that's being expected of them, but mm -hmm. there's no grading yet. So how is that? How is that working? That's a great question. So for the AP enrichment, we actually did design that to be applied to a block five on the kids' schedule, and added it to a pass fail with a pass distinguished, pass advanced, pass basic option. Um, so teachers could have a grade book that we put active on their technically inactive semester, so there will be a grade. Oh, I should probably look at that. I have a schematic that I won't show now because it's more complicated than this meeting would necessarily be needed for. Um, but it's a nice graphic of why and how that works. Yeah. In one of the um, emails that we got, it had the number of kids taking AP classes. I want to say it was like 250, 280, something like that. Okay. I, I don't know. It was something that got sent out this week. But um, do you know, do you have a sense of what percentage of kids are taking, I guess, one or I assume that 
if they're taking one, they tend to take more than one. Thank you. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know off the top of my head either. We could look that up though. Okay. Is that like 50% or? Have them take an AP. Is there also different grade levels? Well, I think it, it grows as the students. Yeah. yeah, older. Yeah. So I guess for seniors, or I don't know, it doesn't really yeah. matter. For juniors and seniors, probably. I know, you know, for what freshmen we have the human geography. We just started course. some new ones. That's new. New ones right. for grade nine. Um, and then we have typically grade 10 kids will take biology, um, AP bio. But generally speaking, it's juniors and seniors. But I don't have the proportion of kids. I, I'm just, the reason I'm asking is to try to get a sense for how many kids are. Um, like how that extra block is impacting on how many kids it yeah. has an impact on. Right, so we can definitely get that information. I would say that for all kids enrolled in AP though, this block is necessary to make this whole thing kind of work for them. Um, so that's where it becomes kind of hard where one size fits all stuff rarely works, but here there was really no other way for us to make sure that these kids had this experience without a scheduling conflict someplace else. Um, what, I, what I kind of will say now, behind the scenes of all of this, so on, there's a little note on the agenda that says like base. So this is something that we try to make sure that the whole school follows. What we have found is that folks need, kids need, sort of different options and parts and pieces that aren't necessarily clear and articulated here because it will work for one kid but not for another. And we'll talk a little bit about those things behind the scenes. And one of those things is some AP teachers have found, particularly math science ones, I need even more time. So they've scheduled like an extra section that you might not be able to see on the surface here. Yeah. So, so for kids not in those AP courses though, they would at that time really begin starting some of maybe the work that was assigned in their morning classes or working with teachers at that time to get some extra support and they would continue that into the afternoon and we extend the online days until about three just to give folks some extra time to work through this because we know that it takes longer to work on things at home there's sometimes stuff that goes on at home where our in-person days end at two, which was necessary to balance the district needs for busing. So that's kind of the Monday, Tuesday day. I will say I that- I have more question about that. Sure. Um, for the afternoon sessions, the teachers, is it, they're mostly available via email? So it, they're available really anyway on these days. So preferably if a student has a question that really someone needs to dig into or you know, need a visual or to draw something out, they would be available by Google Meet. What I think ends up happening is that we'll try to be contacting with a kid and then it ends up being a conversation back and forth from email and someone's like, can we just please go online face to face? Um, so in the survey results that we'll look at a little later, we asked the teachers about how they do that with kids and the highest percentages of responses were 85%, I think each, reported primarily through email or Google Meets. So I think it depends on the teacher or the kid. Some kids um, feel uncomfortable being on the other end of a computer kind of so face to face with, with their teacher that way. So they prefer, you know, but it's a very cumbersome explanation through email about how to do you know, factoring. to describe yeah. something that they don't know how to do. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so it depends on the kid and the teacher. <coughs> we would obviously advocate for it to be through Google Meets if possible. We have roughly one kid today enrolled in AP classes. That, that's counting all the enrollments. Sorry, some, so 150 enrollments. So okay. there may be a kid who's taking three separate classes. I just counted the number of students. Oh, in so 150 classes. people. 150 sort of slot. slots. Oh, okay. So maybe a few people. So some kids right. may be taking a couple of classes yeah. they didn't I would guess, class. and this is truly a guess, but probably around 100 different students. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just, Nancy, is that, do you have a sense of if that's up or down from the past? Um, but, I I, I'm sorry, it's hard. Every year, it's really hard to say. I, this year we did not require a summer assignment, so there wasn't that normal culling that happens. Mm -hmm. where every kid who signed up got to take the class. Right. 
Okay, so one of the things I'll point out now that we'll talk about a little later, and I'm cognizant of our time, because that always takes longer than we anticipate. Um, when we made the schedule, we were under the impression that SRTC, more so our VOC program, was going to the different schedule, and they had their plan approved later than our plan. So um, that day one block three and day one block four on Tuesday morning is actually in conflict for a portion of our juniors with the Sanford schedule. So what teachers have done, which is another example of like a behind the scenes thing that we can't see, all of the junior teachers who have morning vocational students have this conflict and created an extra class section to teach those kids specifically outside of this um, and or record a separate course for student prefers that mode instead. So that's another example of something that happens. We have a fix for that on our next version of this plan, um, but we're going with this for now to get a work around, but we can fix it. Yeah. And that's about 100 and it's a, a little over 100 kids that were that utilize the vocational programs. Yeah. So the in-person days, so the show came, gave you kind of a, uh, a visualization of some of the things that are weird but working um, in terms of our operations of safety on those days. So Wednesday is our in-person day for juniors and seniors. And I would say that by and large, those guys were most quick to adapt to the processes and procedures. And we weren't really sure how they were going to react to it because they're most used to the other procedures, but they've done an amazing job. Um, and they seem really happy to be here when they're here. We're happy to see them. Um, and we run a pretty typical bell schedule for, for that day. And you can kind of see the times there. And Mr. Finley did a good job explaining the lunch procedure. So three lunches at three different locations. So technically that's kind of like nine different feeding opportunities. <laughs> and two of those spaces are actually divided into what we are referring to as east and west locations of those cafeterias to be compliant with the safety measures. So they're divided by a 14 foot barrier. We have assigned classes and teachers walk their kids down, which are not typical things for high school. So it is no small feat, which is why I just bring up the lunches. Now, knowing that a lot of our scale up considerations for maybe later down the road for more in person, on the surface seem simple and start until you start realizing, I don't know how we're gonna feed them type stuff, which yeah. might not be obvious. If you us. walk into the cafeteria, they've got individual desks a little bit facing in a certain way. And that's, you know, it's unusual for our kids that, and it's changed, we, did, we were doing um, the tables with a seat here and a seat here, but it became apparent that we really needed to be able to contact trace in the cafeteria if possible. So, the, the custodial crew came in and took out all those tables and set up individual small tables. It's it's a thing, but okay. they've done it. So you can always you can take a peek at that. Yeah, yeah. By all means, go try it out. They were doing a really good job with the kids stay seated the entire lunch period and like gave us a wave if they need to get up and do something and they put their masks back on before moving. And so um, all of that happens and it's going very well so far. So we're pleasantly because that was again as high school folks we're not we've never seen them do that before so <laughs> they are doing it um but we definitely work you know there's no way that they're going to do this like no i don't know but they are so it's great they eliminate yeah. some much time drama mm -hmm. yeah yes well yeah there's some pleasant things about this stuff that's actually helping in other areas for sure um yeah so um what's also happening so that behind the scenes on all of these days is the coming and going of SRTC kids on to physically to Sanford and back. So that's another piece where again, on the surface, we say, well, why can't we just add this or that? Because frequently behind the scenes, that folk component is always a bit of a sticking point. So um, we've worked around a lot of it, but it kind of always comes back in when we think we've got a great idea to get some more folks in. We're like, ah, but it creates this problem. So on Wednesdays, just so you know, VOC is actually remote. Um, so that's an interesting twist. And so when our juniors and seniors are here, when they're done with our classes, they're struggling to try to get online to get to some of their VOC remote classes. So that's a little bit of a struggle for some of our kids. Um, but they're in the building? They're in the building. So let's say that they're PM VOC, which means they're with us for noble classes, blocks one and two. And then SRTC wants them on the computer live with them, 
for three and four for them. So, and then there's the reverse is true for the more. So they go to a classroom, but they're logging on to the remote book program. Yeah. Or they or they are able to go home, right? right. If they can make it home, they go home okay. and do it. Some kids. It's just the afternoon. Yeah, they've usually they've pushed it back to allow our kids time to transition out of our classes to eat something. Um, you know, but some kids, you know, notice and say, hey, why? what are you doing out here? And they're like on their computers on, on a bench trying to get into the class. So the sort of that synchronous remote component can be tough sometimes for those reasons. Um, so on Wednesday, that's kind of how that works. On Thursday, we have the little guys come in, so eight and nine, so that's what we had today. And then Friday, we have eight again and 10. And again, we chose the extra time for eight to be consistent with the fact that six and seven get two days Monday, Tuesday, and then eight's normally kind of that band, six through eight, they also get two days. What is, again, maybe not apparent through this is our full remote population of kids are full remote learners because we don't come in for in person at all. They basically follow along, but from home. So whatever schedule their grade level is doing, they're doing but from home. So Monday, Tuesday, everybody's the same, no matter what. So if I'm a stay-at-home kiddo on Wednesday, I'm at home clicking into my classrooms at the time that we're ringing the bells here at school. So the only difference is they're at home. And that's where like, the teacher's doing that tricky piece of I'm teaching, kind of like what we're doing right now a little bit, except I'm definitely not on purpose, but I'm ignoring the board at home, right? Because we're kind of here together. So if I'm teaching, I've got my juniors and seniors, but some of my kids are at home, so I would be trying to click over and say, hey, Len, I noticed you turned your camera off. Just <laughs> turn your camera back on. And then it would be blank, and then Lynn like disappeared on us, and I have to write an email home. Or Travis, I noticed you haven't moved, and then it's a cardboard cutout of Travis. <laughs> and, yeah. Or I've got kids typing in the chat, I don't get it, do it again. I can't hear you, do it again. So you've read, hopefully, some of the comments from the teachers about like, trying to do this to the kids. And so that's what that's kind of like. So again, behind the scenes stuff that you can't see, it's because that's hard. So like Travis is not answering me. So I, all my remote kids, we're gonna have another class section after this so I can make sure you have really got what I'm saying. Or I'm a gym teacher. I'm carrying you guys around, but we're going outside and I've lost signal. So this is what we're doing in class. Here's the learning targets. Go do it at home or go have some independent time to do the run. And then we'll check that on at the end. So that's the kind of that juggling piece. That's a little tricky for folks, but we're, they're doing an amazing job trying, um, but it's definitely a challenge. We didn't think we'd be in this place, but here we are. So do, you, do you think a better solution might be separate teachers from just the remote kids. So yes, yeah, so we would love to have done that. The problem for us in being different than the little guys where you, if you're an elementary school teacher, you have, you're, you're, you're the teacher and those are your kids and maybe there's specials that would rotate in. You know, high school kids have numerous teachers. So right now, of course, it's yeah. at all the grade levels too. Right. So that's the hard yeah. part. It's not even yeah. just that we need a sign. Yeah. Yeah. Business. All the different science certifications. Yeah, we should be able to teach physics. Exactly. <laughs> and that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So five grade levels, all the different subject areas, and then the reality is we can't use our staff to necessarily do that because then there's no one here to teach their kids that are here live, right? So our teachers that are full remote teachers, we only have I think three and a half of them. Three. Yeah, three and a half. Um, right now, what they're doing to give you that kind of visual. So let's say I'm a teacher and I'm at home. I'm projecting my head, which we've nicknamed like the Wizard of Oz thing. So picture like the screen and there's a head and the screen. So I'm teaching English from home. My kids are here live. We have a, we have a teacher's aide essentially or ed tech in the room who facilitates the supervision component or Johnny has a question in the back. And that's how we're managing that. But if we were to take them out to try to deal with all the remote kids, no one would be there to teach their class. So, but they also have remote kids as well. So they're remote. Yeah. There are kids who are remote. So the teachers in the sky, the kids are in the sky, but they're also live. 
just to give you a tidbit bit of the management of this, <laughs> but I mean, usually tell, it's just hard. Are there any classes that, like at the high school, like even some of the core classes that would, like even if we just picked up a couple of fully remote, like, I don't know, uh, maybe find a teacher that can teach 10 and 11 math, or like some, like maybe not AP physics or, you know, but something that you've got a few more kids that are, um, you know, either we could split them up and teach a couple different, like that are, you know what I mean? So that like so, we could offer something a little bit more to the remote kids, but then also in turn, the teacher that's in the classroom can more fully focus on the classroom. And so, one of the things you just have to wrap your head around, obviously, is that this has all happened in a period of from March until now, developing all of the work that these guys are doing. So we are actually working on developing a remote academy that, spe like, that specifically takes the K-12 remote kids off of the, really off the shoulders of the in-person folks. So it's coming, but it's it's going to take us a while to to really develop that. But that's part of it, and be prepared in the conversations in our budget to talk about those kind of things. Yeah, but are we thinking? I mean, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah. But, um, you know, is are, are we? Th uh, I, I don't know. I guess I feel like this is as good a time as any to try something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the pieces that becomes a little bit tricky. And I think we kind of has worked with how we're doing it is, and it's not a lot, but there are situations where students are not able to come into the building. So maybe it's a student that's had to quarantine. This allows them to stay in lockstep with their class versus if they had to sort of be farmed out, I guess, to this remote teacher. I don't think there would be the cohesion among that. And I mean, it's happening. A fair amount. I mean, we had some yes. students who may have been siblings related with a, a positive case somewhere. Someone or someone travels. You well, know, now so you can go away. Cautious. Right, you can go away for a long weekend and come back and have to quarantine for 14 days. So it's just like ah, and that's happening. So I think the fact that kids can log on, that's been a good thing because they can stay in touch. But I think you're right that it, as a whole, it would make life easier. But it might also create some, and I think the other hard part is, I don't know, I think we're feel strongly like that we have really good teachers who are working hard. And I guess my fear would be, and this is just me, but to find someone who's sort of out there right now in almost November who mm -hmm. doesn't have a teaching job and is interested in this position. Like I feel like I would almost be guaranteeing that the, their their experience would be substandard, I guess. And that, you know. But I I don't disagree with you either. Yeah, no one disagrees. It's just You're how right. it's just how to do it. It's, um, it's Should you guys have some ideas of things either that you'd like to tweak or yeah. like if not adding? Yeah. You do. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, it's coming. Yep. Yes. Definitely. Yep. So, but this issue is a tough issue. But I think there's just one more quick point there with what AJ was saying. Similarly, is that I know that at the younger grade levels we've kind of. Um, beefed up that expectation that you kind of pick a pick remote or pick in person. It's a little that's we're not as stringent that the high schools we do have this sort of option. But kids are kind of moving from one to the other still on our level and them going to a different person with how high school grading works makes it much more difficult to ever say like we're gonna put you back into a regular class when you've been to this other place and maybe the curriculum doesn't quite match in grade books and all of that. So this is a little trickier, but we've got some ideas, yeah. So what I'm gonna kind of quick try to pick up the pace a little bit. I don't wanna rush you guys, but I just don't wanna also um, know you're away from your homes. Behind the scenes piece, I mentioned most of these as we were talking, but just so they're given a bit of an at a glance is that while things may seem simple on the surface, they're, they're rarely, they really are. And to meet the needs of kiddos as they come up in ways that we can't address through pushing it out to everyone, here are some things just to keep in mind that we've got those Sanford classes going on through all the background all day long. Um, and then secondly, right now, as I mentioned, all of our teachers who are dealing 
with that AM vote conflict on Tuesdays have set up a separate class that you can't necessarily see on that schedule. Um, there is a, what we're calling extra, extra AP section, so not the AP you're seeing on the Monday, Tuesday, but those math science folks in particular have set up an extra section to meet the needs of those kids that you necessarily can't see. Um, a lot of our folks too would normally be using nighttime or different in-class opportunities for honors options. A lot of them are doing pullout classes to be able to really concentrate on meeting the needs of those learners too. Um, as I mentioned, it's really tough, right? I gotta pull my Travis's and those guys at home together because I'm doing my best to make sure they're getting it there, but I've got kiddos here, so most of them are pulling them out too. Um, we have found through some of the survey data, and this is to be expected anyways, but a lot of case managers are pulling together their groups of kiddos with IEPs to do some reteaching of things that maybe weren't quite clear or they weren't sure if they were clear because the remote setting sometimes it's hard to read if kids are getting it or not. That's happening too. And lastly, number seven are things that we've started doing really over the past handful of weeks is we, we had mentioned in the very beginning that our first groups to be targeting for more in-person would be the groups most at high risk. And so on some of the Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday days, we are inviting, not invited, welcoming some sixth and seventh grade kiddos who are more special needs programs. So they are here on some of our days. Um, and at this point as well, kiddos in 8 through 12 are coming on other in-person days that are in some of those specialized programs as well right now. Um, we have a sense done, of how many um, kids that's covered? I have a spreadsheet, but I can't pull it up right now because it would broadcast it. Students are more what it's called. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, I so think that's our six now. to eight, eight to ten, but in that range of students. Yes, it's, it's, sorry, what was it? six to eight, eight to ten. A so couple dozen. In that ballpark for kids that. For one dozen, half a dozen, dozen. And for each grade or a total? Total. total. So these are usually kids with very high needs at this point um, who require probably two or three staff members to self contain for lots of them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're also beginning bringing in kiddos at grade nine who are being identified through the bar process or the risk review process for extra in person <laughs> time. To get some work done that we started this week. Yep. This week. And um, that's going to expand quickly. Um, we, we have some students who are struggling to keep up with their load, you know, the course load and kind of yep. look at the, some of the great stuff and, and that becomes apparent. So, yeah, and, and I think families have been very, very receptive to that and interested in, in getting kids that dedicated work time. And we're going to be looking to expand that about some other great levels yes. too. We've got, one think, one junior set up to do something a little bit like that on their own day, but on the modified schedule. And then some multiple pathways to those and coming in on their off day to really just get some, some staff connections. We're working at the work outside on the garden project right now. There's some examples of what we're kind of trying to do to slowly bring some folks in when we realize, okay, as Mr. Finley said, this seems to be working. We feel like we can handle some, at least some small populations who really need some more time safely. So there's that. Okay. The other documents here are things we've already talked about. There's extra things for, for you guys. I know that one of the challenges you have are trying to answer some questions from some folks who might be very specific. Um, so, for example, under the explanation of the plan, the yellow plan, um, I linked the letter that we sent to parents have probably seen it, but that's always helpful to kind of refer back to so you can see exactly what we told them. Feel free to refer back to that. And then those grade level planners are, all right, my kid's not in the building today and we're not doing together time synchronous. What's my kid supposed to be doing? And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next step, step to how to make that more clear and more structured. Um, but those are just tools to kind of help. But we're not going to go through all of those right now. All right, next part is some of the data that we put together. So I'm going to turn it over to AJ to talk for a little while. Sure, and definitely, please, there is a lot of information here. Um, please jump in at any point if, if either it's going too fast or just, hey, what does that mean? Where did that come from? So the first page has the um, number of students who are currently working in both the hybrid and the fully remote models. So you can see there, it's a little over 21% of our kids currently are working fully remote. 
Um, I'm sorry, which, which yep. sheet are you This is on? back on the full copy. Yep, full copy, and, and it's three. page three, technically, at the bottom. Okay. Report of data, remote versus hybrid plan enrollments. Okay. Yep. So um, fully remote students, we have 255 currently, and, and as it says here, that number has steadily but slowly increased as time has gone along. Um, and then the, the highest percentage of students currently we have right now is grade 10, um, with a little over a quarter of the students working fully remotely. Do you have a sense of, um, do you feel like the people that are slowly but steadily choosing remote, um, do you have a sense of whether or not it's fully for health reasons, or is it more like, eh, it's just easier? I think for some students, they can't stand being in a mask all day. It's really hard for them, so they choose that. Um, I think for others, it is a health concern. Yep. We have a lot of parents who are caring for their parents in the same home, so they worry about transmission of germs and those kinds of things. But is that something that would have changed? I just mean more of the change. Well, I think as the numbers kind of fluctuate yeah. within Maine, I think when we're lower, they're not, they're not so worried. But when we started having the outbreaks in Stanford, um, and now that the numbers have continued to climb, I think some yep. and it are nervous. a little bit ebb and flow, and even beyond this sort of parents who have fully you know, said, we're going to work remote for the time being. There are, as I spoke earlier, I mean, we've had a, a three, four, five families in that range just this week. The numbers are increasing. I'm worried. We're going to go ahead and keep our kids home for a couple of weeks um, and, and have them. And it's, it, it's a tough spot because, no, we're not going to change them. We're trying to keep some consistency. But if the option is either be absent or log in and get the instruction, we're all, I mean, I think we're always like, yeah, log in, you know, I mean, we're not, you know, we don't want to commit to this fully remote, but if those are the two options, you're like, yeah, we want, we want you to keep learning, so please log in, click on the link, and join, join class, so. And, and did we give, a, did we sort of say that there was a date? Yeah, yeah, like last Friday, yes. is that right? So we, we think that these numbers will stay fairly, so, the so until it's, the end yeah, of the semester. it's hard to really, Tell a family that they can't when they're really, when it when it is for a health reason and it's really a really right. well, they, although it wouldn't go the other way necessarily. Uh, it's it's been it's more the rare. Other way. It's been rare coming the other way. I mean, even you know, again, if everything worked and the classroom continued to be safe, we had this family who said, My work schedule has changed and I can't be home anymore. Is there absolutely any way that my kid could come to school? I think we'd say yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think our model of the same teacher working with the student mm -hmm. makes it easier to say yes than it would at, at K to seven. Okay. And that is an I'm not being, that's that's a need to be difficult here, but we're talking about eight through twelve. So I assume we've yeah. already made the assumption that these kids are home with no parents. Um, not always. always. Certainly not always. I mean, there are some educationally who the parent will say, hey, I'm making sure. Yeah, I think for the large part, yes. Okay. But we've had families call and say, my work schedule, I got, I got, my shift got moved. Can I go ahead and switch? Yeah, I mean, if, and again, not so much from the, will the kid be safe at home, but will they get the, the same work completion that they were completing with yeah. the parent there? Sure. Some parents actually take their kids to work with them, and the kids work from their workplace. You have that interesting. situation. Yes. Um, that were not bringing their children to work with them have started to as they have struggled a little bit. I'm going to be getting my car. <laughs> and it's not easy. We have a number of grandparents raising their grandchildren, and it's always sort of a weird position for them. I've, I've had two conversations just in the past week. They can't get the kids up in the morning, and so they're really struggling. And it's an argument, and they, you know, it's. They, they want to fight the battles. So I met with a parent and, or a grandparent and the kid, and I said, listen, why don't you just come in one day a week? Don't you think that will help? And he was like, oh, all right. So it was actually the opposite. It was all remote, and now he's going to come in for a day, at least get the time with his teacher that he was just avoiding, and the grandmother had no, couldn't figure out what to do to get him to do what he needed to do. Yeah. So there's a variety of reasons why folks choose these options. We always try to support the family what they believe is best first, and then work slowly to to say, hey, maybe another option might actually be better. How can we help you with, with that? So. 
The next piece is attendance, if yeah. you want to take a look there. So this is based upon the three-week average of attendance data. And so uh, we'll just go through this a little more quickly. There's a couple of big points we really just wanted to kind of show you from it. So kids who are enrolled in the full hybrid option, so those kids are coming into school on their day and then remote on the other days, the attendance is about 96%, which is pretty good. Um, the, it's almost as high as we have in a normal year. Yeah. Yeah. So the attendance for the kiddos following us along from home, so those, those kiddos, which work like what Travis is doing right now, you'll notice that it's at 86.4%. At first, that doesn't seem like a big difference, but a 10% difference in attendance is actually a lot yeah. um, in terms of attendance standards as far as they go. On Mondays and Tuesdays, where all those kids are together, just for that together time stuff, the online, we're at about 92%. Overall, so all of that kind of combined, so if you're asking me, what's the attendance of noble kids doing the classes, it is about 90%. And that is about 5% lower than our aggregate on a typical year. We're usually a little bit higher than that. That's to be you know, expected given the conditions. This is all certainly much better than projected, so I think that this would pleasantly surprise, although we're obviously very concerned about those kids who aren't kind of making it. The next table here is a, can be a little bit tough to read, so we pulled out kind of the big takeaway bullets at the bottom. So Noble High School kiddos enrolled in that full remote option at the older grade levels, so grades 11 and 12, are absent from class at a rate twice as high as kids enrolled in the hybrid option. And that considers not just the hybrids in-person day, but it also factors in their, like, say, their Monday, Tuesday remote. It, it does not. That includes just the Wednesday attendance. Oh, OK. So yes, OK. Yeah, if yeah, you look so at just, just Wednesdays only. So, value here, so this is comparing these two um, a Okay, so it's comparing the kids that are enrolled in fully remote in 11 and 12 to the hybrid 11 and 12s only on Wednesday. Yeah, so coming in person. Yeah. So those that come do in we, person. Is there a piece of this, uh, and maybe it's here, but like, do you see the same drop off with those 11 and 12s on their Monday, Tuesday? Their attendance is similar, and I think the hybrid students is a little bit worse. Um, so overall, the hybrid attendance seems to be average out a little bit lower. So the kids that are coming in tend to also check in for their remote classes. At a higher rate than the remote ones. Okay. Yes. So what's kind of interesting about those data around the Wednesday piece and the remote kids following along home and not doing as much as it, we see that kind of trend, right? So that the kids trying to follow along through the remote setting are less apt to show up for a course than if you were to come in for in-person. I guess it, again, isn't, isn't completely su surprising. And the next bullet here is basically really a similar point that we, we see that difference, even it's more magnified for the younger kids trying to follow along at home on that remote synchronous day. So even though we're tying them in through a structured schedule, um, that's not necessarily making up for the fact that you know, they're not coming to the same rate as their peers were live in person. Um, which tells us that, you know, in terms of our efforts moving forward, if we can get more of them in person, that would be awesome for us. But complicated. Um, so I have a question. Um, I, I noticed in some of the... Have a question? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, and I, I noticed in some of the, the parent and student responses, the degree of difficulty they're having with technology. Could some of the drop-off be because of that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. I believe yeah. that's why. Okay. <laughs> is, is there, I mean, it also seems like the Chromebooks are a problem. Is there any thought with the funds that we have available and must spend by December to switch over to Macs <laughs> or yeah, another absolutely. PC or something? We're, we're in process. That's a okay. for sure. All right. So that's a great question, Shreya. So that's part of the concern around <laughs> the question just so oh, yeah. Yeah. Shreya was asking about could some of our concerns around attendance for the full remote kiddos be tied? to some of our technology issues. So when we looked at the survey, that was like abundantly clear. Um, uh, connectivity issues that teachers have some of connectivity issues within the building. So for like me trying to talk to Travis, right? My stuff would end up dropping. I'm not doing very much right now, so I'm fine. Uh, 
all of those things, and then the Chromebooks themselves um, have kind of run their course, and they're supposed to be updated. So, this is the first part of that, and Chris is out there, but um, we, I believe Chris purchased a number of upgrade materials for folks that should help this um, in terms of device issues, on-site sound indicators of their devices. But will always be, I think, a little bit tricky is the Wi-Fi stuff at home. We've given out hotspots and things like that, but if you're in a dead area, that hotspot's not going to really work. That's what we're finding. We kind of put out all of the accessories minimize the issue, but it's still tough for kids to get to that live By the time they finally get it all on, you know, maybe 30 minutes into class, and then we're in, and then they have to follow the teacher. I think it's frustrating for kids, especially kids who are higher anxiety trying to do this from home. It's hard. Um, but yeah, so Mr. Reed, I think that is an issue for sure, but it's one that we're hoping will be resolved shortly. We're, we're just waiting on a lot of the stuff to get shipped. Right because it's, everyone's trying to do the same thing. Oh, I have a question that's sort of half that and half attendance. Yeah. Um, what are we doing with kids that are um, sort of late on the remote stuff? How does that get, um, like, and especially if it has to be, if it happens to be a technology issue or not, I don't know, like, yeah. they could probably say it was. <laughs> yeah, no, so we, we are still utilizing sort of a tardy as, and obviously if there are technology concerns that lead to that, it's excused. Um, I think it's been important for us to continue for marking them just because that becomes sort of a reminder to a teacher a lot of times that I have to circle back with this kid. Um, so obviously if it's excused, whether absent excused or tardy excused, there's no negative impact to the kid, but it is that reminder to the teacher that I gotta, you know, when I hold, you know, as Ellie talked about, all, all the, the things that happen behind the scenes, I've got to make sure with like that that kiddo to who will meet to circle back with them because otherwise they're not gonna have whatever the concept is. Yeah. It, 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 if we feel there's a viable tech issue, like a parent has called or it, that we have a tech ticket, we, we excuse that stuff. Yeah. Um, so. I, I have to see if it's working properly for me because this is the first year I haven't received many tardy notices. Right? <laughs> it is. The calls are going out, I can assure you. So that's a good thing. Yeah, we have some nice feedback. Ellie, I'm going to just, well, really with the grading, change up. Just, I'm going to have folks just with time scroll to, with grading, the two boxes that just say hybrid option and re full remote option. They hopefully will fit pretty well right on your screen so you can see both of those together. The top box certainly takes some time to look at that sort of all everybody at once um, but I think what we found is some some interesting information with the hybrid versus the full remote and probably in a lot of cases this can be traced back to attendance because if students aren't attending us at a high of a rate it's going to be hard to achieve that as high of a rate but um, we are definitely noticing that students especially in grades 8 9 and 10 there is a difference in achievement between those hybrid and those remote only students. So just to, to sort of pick one example out, grade eight, with it being at the top of both of those charts, um, you know, 98 students with at least one NM, um, which is about 44, 45% of the, the class versus the two thirds of the class of those remote students. And I think the other piece is that was important is that's just failing upwards. If it's failing one course and you're really close, those are pretty easy to remedy. I mean, we're still at a point in the year, even though it was our first progress report, but if you have a zero or two, that can cause you to be in that situation. So that, that can happen. I think the part that was most, um, you know, sort of spoke the most is all the way over to the right, the average NMs per student, um, whereas for an eighth grader of those, kids failing a course, of those 98 kids, they were failing on average 1.7, 1.68 courses versus the remote students that were failing on average about a half a class more, um, 0.6 more. So they're in a much worse spot, I think. And this would um, relate to like past years. Yeah, it's, 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 it's higher. It's higher. Um, yeah, I, I would say the hybrid is a little bit higher than where it would be right now. And I think there's typically an eighth grade adjustment period that that is typical. The remote only number is quite a bit higher. Um, so 
Right? Yeah. So the kind of takeaway here, the bullets at the, at the bottom, and, and we've we've probably done more analysis than is necessary here for, this, <laughs> for the purpose of this meeting, but um, by and large, we see the trend really across all grade levels that those fully remote kids, the follow along at home kiddos, are, are failing courses more frequently than the other kiddos. The exception is that grade 11 12, they're really kind of similar on par. Um, so that's useful information for us to know. We try to design the next phases to really focus our efforts on more of those little guys like how can we fix some of this stuff going on. And again, this is a snapshot in time. It could change, so we're constantly looking at these things, but that's why looking at these things is important for us. So when we make a design choice to say, hey, we're gonna do X, Y, or Z with juniors and seniors, it might be because they're okay or more okay right now. We might focus on um, some other guys to get them some support, for example. Collected feedback. So the next phase here are things that you've um, hopefully had a chance to glance at already. One of the things, again, so there's some qualitative commentary from some folks in here, teachers and, and kids and parents that we wouldn't necessarily want to broadcast because we really appreciate the feedback, but we really think that it's sacred, that is something they were letting us know about, particularly in terms of some challenges that they were having. So um, I'm not going to go through and read that, but you have all of that. Um, and I thought it was really informative and helpful to read. I think people were really honest about that. Um, what I will quickly do is just go through some of the pie charts, um, about 30 seconds each in terms of these documents. And again, I'm not trying to rush, it's just... Can I, can I just, sorry, I, I always do this, go back, just one quick question for the grades. Yes. Um, do you guys ever break that down for male-female? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. And do you see mm -hmm. the disparity? Yes, I would say at, at this snapshot in time, there was... Um, males were quite a bit higher, especially at the younger levels. I think it evened out a little bit at 11 and 12. And again, I don't have the numbers, you know, but I would say it was within at a grade to 11 and 12, 60, 40. But as you get younger, it was approaching 70, 30, if not 75, 25, something and, like that. So and is that, I have to, is that very different than a typical year? No, like it's I said. Not. no. Yeah. Uh, those it'll, percentages it'll it's, are, it's an uptick among all right now, but that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we can look at those data to be yeah. accurate numbers. Yeah, sure. But, um, but, I mean, that's, that's, but that's a good point. You. That's enough. I yeah. mean, that that ballpark is yeah. enough for me. But I I think that's I think that's a point that is important. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 And, and the anecdotal feedback that I heard in the spring was that shift had a more significant impact on. On boys, just yeah. for reasons that are not a surprise to any of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's something more noting. Definitely, you're right. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting demographic pieces to this that we can look at more closely, and that are important to consider as we design things in terms of equity for kids too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in terms of, of teacher feedback here, the first couple of, of graphs are pretty straightforward. I'm just asking them their role and who they teach. Um, What's interesting here is that in terms of student attendance, a lot of teachers feel like the, the attendance is, is about the same, the sort of equal portions feeling it's either higher or lower than normal. So again, these types of conditions really affect everyone differently, so that's not necessarily surprising. In terms of student workload, we talk more about workload in the other surveys as well, in terms of perspectives and breaking it out by grade level. But that's one of those things that can be very subjective, is that you know, we, AGI can be given the same assignment, same workload, and I think it's too much, and thinks it's too little. I, he does his, I don't do mine. You know, so it's sort of one of those things. It's a, be a quagmire to work that out. Um, but 60 or so percent, so the majority of teachers are to say they're signing, um, our work completion is about the same this year. And then again, some folks higher, some folks lower. In terms of the volume that teachers are assigning, not surprisingly, about half say it's less than usual. They see the kids less frequently. Kids are struggling more, so they kind of go with the piece of the kid, uh, the kids in front of them. So they are having to adjust in response to the needs of the kids. Um, a good portion, about 40%, is about the same. And some folks say they're signing more than usual. In terms of the rigor, so how hard is that work they are assigning? Vast majority is 77%, that it's about the same in terms of the richness and how difficult the assignments are. 
um, with about 20% saying that it is lower than usual. Again, not surprising there. Um, the vast majority of teachers have unleashed their honors options at this point. Um, we're, we'll look at to see why some folks say no. My guess is that they aren't necessarily responsible for doing that anyways. It's not the grade level or course, um, or they don't have that course until next semester. But at this point, if they should have, that has happened. Um, in terms of kids' participation in those things, so we've been talking a lot about trying to provide these opportunities for enrichment, opportunities for support, but they're not always taken. Um, but we want to make sure that they have them, which is why we asked the question. Um, so you can see there that most teachers have about 10% of their class participating. And then a smaller portion has about more than that, about 30%. Um, or so you can see the breakdown there. Yeah, I lean into Joe. I, I would say that is pretty typical. Yes. With a with a regular year, so sort of that rate mm -hmm. doesn't change much. Right. And again, that's because we have heterogeneously group classrooms. That's one of our differentiation strategies there to sort of extend and challenge those kids who maybe in a more traditional school would be in an honors track or something like that. So again, this was kind of hinging on a sort of the sweetest part, and I'm not going to show the um, comments, but about half of our teachers having significant issues with technology that they are experiencing or that they're noticing that their kiddos are experiencing on the other end. Um, and again, if you haven't read those comments yet, um, please do so later because they're really paint a pretty clear picture of what folks are dealing with. The next piece here, we're really trying to make sure we're doing our best to meet the needs of everyone, which is very hard, and sometimes those needs are completely opposite directions. Um, you're asking about families and students that have asked for you to increase the rate or increase the workload. Um, at this point, it's about 90% of our teachers have not received requests like that, but 10% have some. It's sort of the opposite question. Folks reaching out for more support. Um, you can see here that it's different, that more teachers are hearing from folks that we, they need some more support um, than not. The previous question. The next piece about the, how teachers are utilizing their time on those Monday, Tuesday days. So working with students in those support sections. And we're really asking about the quantity of students, so again, just because we're providing an opportunity doesn't necessarily mean that all the kids are really taking taking that on. Let's see the result there. And this was kind of back to your question, Denise, about how that was happening. And that was where email and Google Meet individual sessions, it was about 80 something percent, 85 for one, 82 for the other are the um, primary. And then the next one up is small group sessions through Google. So that would be five, come on back. Here again, I'm going to kind of not go through all the comments because um, this is what the teachers had written. But we were asking teachers how they set up those asynchronous days. So again, the example I'll use is if I'm an eighth grader and uh, Monday, Tuesday, it's a line thing. An eighth grader Thursday, Friday in the building. So, like, what the heck am I doing on Wednesday? And so, we were asking teachers how they structure the day for kids on those asynchronous days. And you'll see one of the things that's very apparent is that how teachers are using that day varies wildly. And so, what one of our jobs is going to be is to set some consistent parameters and expectations for that. So, the experience for kids on those days isn't so variable depending upon who their teachers are. Some of these comments, can we assume that even though this question is about eighth grade, okay, so some of these some of these teachers are teaching mixed grades, which explains it. Okay. Yes. yes. So most of our teachers teach more than one grade level. That's another one of those, this makes it more complicated than we would like things into place. But I really encourage you to read read through those um, if you haven't already. The next piece that we'll kind of quickly move through is that you'll see that 95% of teachers are dealing with that like two worlds piece, right? So they've got the kiddos live here and kiddos on the screen that they're trying to manage. Um, 
and then asking them how difficult that is in 17b. And you can see here that almost all of the teachers reported that is high to moderate level of difficulty in managing both of that. Not surprising there. You guys are all very well behaved class. And <laughs> our kids are very well behaved too, but you know, working with teenagers in both those worlds is tough. And then indicate whether that you hold separate to sort of manage as a completely separate class after the fact. It's about half and half. And that could, the reason for that, I'm not sure we can dig into that maybe more. Yeah, I think it fell, and certainly not 100% one way or the other, but it fell a lot. I think a lot of our more elective teachers felt the need to not because students were able to keep up and do, yep. whereas a lot of the core math, history, um, ELA, science, though they were offering because it is like, kids may not be able to see quite as well the science experiment that was happening in class, so they wanted to follow up and maybe do it again for those kids to be able to see to kind of set it up a little bit differently. So it wasn't perfect. We certainly have some folks um, who teach electives that are doing that follow-up, but I think that was very generally speaking. It fell sometimes a lot back. The other option too is that if I'm a teacher and I've got one remote student on the other end and they're like rocking it, I might not need to do that. But that's probably not 50%. But probably not, but it could in total add up to something like that. But we should look, we could look into yeah, more. No, more. It, it, it is interesting. I mean, you know, we have these very few so just, reported here with a staff member or two that have no remote students, which is crazy given that 20% of our school. There. But it happens. Okay, so just so that we can understand what this question is asking. So this would this is asking any teacher from eight through twelve who has some either in person or, or online a set schedule, this is asking if they do other, like the question earlier that's like e email, Google Meets, any of that kind of stuff? Is... No, so this 17C would be, do they hold a separate online block for the remote only students? So for example, I got some feedback today okay. from my sophomore teachers who were just telling me they each offered a separate chunk of time today for their remote only students so for history math ela and, and biology and just kind of hey here's who showed up today here's who i'm still worried about because they didn't show up um so that was like a separate almost class today for that just so those students yeah so let's say after this meeting astrita and travis and everyone over at home so that your mic turned off, I couldn't see the screen, plus I really don't get it, but I was too shy to say anything. Can we have another class and then I hold it completely? We do round two, but with them. That's what that question And would those be considered mandatory? Um, yeah, they, they are. Okay, so would, it, would that count towards the attendance? It does not. It can't because Infinite Campus doesn't recognize what's existing outside of the master schedule of Infinite Campus because the teachers just invented it. So that's a behind the scenes, you can't see it there. No. And that, you know, I mean, the, that attendance probably is not, for those meetings, are not as high as we would like. Yeah. So the next couple questions is really um, get some data, which we already talked about, about VOC teachers trying to work around that VOC conflict, them um, making a separate class. It's a 65-35 because some of the senior teachers don't have to, because senior VOC kids don't have a conflict all the teachers, so make it more complicated. Yeah. Okay. And um, that question I think is important because something we always take into consideration is the teacher's concern around some of these kiddos' um, home situations. It's tough. We, we talk about this as a district all the time around trauma and equity. And you can, you can see here that um, the vast majority of our teachers have high to moderate levels of concern about that impacting learning under these conditions right now. And again, successes and challenges, I'm not going to broadcast all their comments, but you can go through and read those. Um, they, despite some of these challenges with, with technology and the things, they're, they are working through them with really hard. Um, the majority of them feel that kiddos are being successful this year, despite, I think, all of it. Yeah. That was longer than I intended. Dude, shut on that. Uh, but there's a lot there's a lot of here. Um, I know. I think we should go on to uh, next steps. Next steps. Yeah. yeah.
that worked for, for you all? I, I um, yeah, I, without going through the other two, the, the students and the parents ones, was there anything that jumped out to you guys? Um, like, you know, we asked the teachers, um, I don't know, is, is the work challenging enough? They say yes, the students say no. Like, is there, was there anything that jumped out that the answers were, like you, you were saying that we all have different perspectives. Um, was there anything that's- Yeah, I mean, I, so I think it is the, the workload question is one that I think unpacking is important. Um, and I think, I'm just looking here so it's accurate. I mean, I think students reported struggling more than their family perceived them to be struggling. Um, but you know, their, just but looking, their grades would agree with the students. Right, mm -hmm. yes. So students just <laughs> to kind of pick out that particular um, area, almost 60%, 59.5% thought it was just right. 39% um, thought it was too much, and that would leave a percent and a half that thought it was too little. Um, flipping over to the parent side, and the one thing we did, and you guys can certainly look through for the parent side, is we did break it out by grade level, because one of the things we were interested in, the expectations, as they should be, are very different for an eighth grader to a 12th grader, so how does that become perceived by um, their parents? And we didn't do it for the younger student, for the student data, only because it, it was pretty concentrated, and it, you know, so, it was very heavy with just right, so we assumed that it would, that would have been the majority among all grades, but that may be worth looking at. But on the parent side, where we broke it out, um, there's a chart, and that was feeling like our, um, in grades 11 and 12, the, the general perception was that it was, you know, just right over 50% of the time. Um, and again, from grade eight through 12, the just right fluctuated between 46% and 54%. So not a huge difference, but we are talking about a thousand responses. So that's a fair number of people. Um, and certainly the amount that felt it was too little went down consistently from grade level to grade level. So that- The older they got, the, the older they got. They the work. Yes, the less they thought it was too easy. Okay. Down to the point of seniors feeling like it was too little work only 13% of the time. So, um. Um, I think the other thing that's really important to, to point out without going through all of those together is on, on the parent and guardian survey. So, when we like send something out using School Messenger, which you might receive those and enjoy all those calls, <laughs> uh, it goes to, from when we send one out 8 through 12, it goes to 3,336 devices or accounts. So that's a lot of pressure for us to make sure we don't have typos, but um, that's what happened when we sent out this survey. So 3,336 folks that represent 1,198 kids. The survey, the parent survey is made from data from 598. 566. Oh, You're close. You're close. 596 responses, um, which is a lot of responses. And of those 596 responses, we sent a second survey to approximately 58 individuals because they had noted that they thought their child wasn't being successful under the current plan. So 58 responses, about 11% of those that filled out the survey. So all the comments you got were from those specifically. Yeah, from about 34 of those 58, 36 of those 58 people. So we filled out the second survey. Yeah. So we they are included in this. They're yeah. included so at the bottom. When you read the yeah. parent comments, it's important to know that we specifically wanted to hear more from those that, that thought that these plans were not successful. And it's a small portion, but it's important but, for us to know right. as we move forward and make changes to take those things into consideration. You can, you can see the majority of the comments are really around more in person would be helpful, um, less remote please kind of stuff. And then a portion of you know, my student feels like on those other days, they're not structured enough, the at home time days. Um, we really, even though it was a small portion of feedback, we took that into consideration, have been looking at that, about how can we help that population of folks who aren't feeling like they're being successful. 
So that's where the second part of the data the survey came from. So the last piece is, all right, so now, now what type of stuff? And the first now what thing is something that we are beginning right now, or what we're calling block five options. So knowing that sometimes it's tricky to do a one size fits all thing during the day, some of the reasons we talked about, these block five options are things, so how can we meet all of these different needs? Some people need more support, some people need more enrichment. I am on page eight, the very last page on the first link. We don't have access. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Come on. That was the one that you yeah. said that. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. By the way, as she's sharing access, I was, uh, Chris, I, I reached out to Chris Russo to make sure that everybody could still be heard appropriately. Yeah. And he said yes, yeah. and he said, I understand that tech is taking a little bit of a beating here. Oh, we don't know. And he said, no, he gets it, but he, he, he's, I asked him if he wanted to speak at some point. So at the end of this, maybe we'll just hear from him about technology because we do have a big push to bring in new tech. But the other piece of this is our, our municipalities, our towns need to really think about their own work in terms of negotiating the bandwidth in our areas because that is the that's a huge struggle but we can make it better but we, we can't, can't fix that can't so we gotta work together on that one i think that that's the appropriate thing that out because that is a huge problem yep. everyone is having a problem yeah does yes. everybody yeah. have it what what do we all have plenty of broadband in the three towns or what is it do we, I'm sorry, what did you say? What, what, what companies do you have? That's Every that's town that's has a different company. Oh. So, <laughs> Russia, like, Lebanon has oh, Comcast Atlantic. and Atlantic, I think, right? We have Atlantic variety. Yeah, so it's 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 a multiple, it's it's pretty th layered problem yeah, that we have. The challenge. And the state is trying to work on that, but we had a whole, we had a whole hope and a prayer that we were going to be able to set up our own towers kind of thing to help get bandwidth to all of our towns um and the state came in and swooped the company away and they're too busy and, and you know it's just it's all about the cash flow right so right. Oh, anyways good. more information but i think chris it can should be all about the education it should be it should be well the state of maine so it's with that the doe it's you know it is yeah. it's just a bigger fish you know the rest of the state versus being able to come in here exactly yeah so so we'll we'll let it's just so complicated like so much of this is so complicated but we're learning every day <laughs> so. so some like some of these things we can make better some of them yeah are a little beyond us but we're going to do our best we need to make sure that whatever we design doesn't put those folks at a more of a disadvantage for stuck in these spots yes. that don't have access to the internet the same way that other kids do so um, so one of the things we're trying to do is give folks more options beyond the base schedule, or what we're calling block fives, um, that occur outside of the regular bell schedule. Some of these are already occurring, so we're already offering standards recovery right now. It's live and up and running in the virtual land. Uh, we're trying to focus on some extra senior sessions that can actually occur on site, so they feel like they have an extra touch point here on their non-in-person days, so Tuesday, Thursdays, or shadow that in-person day. Um, and those being either general academic support, um, senior project support specifically, because that's, that course is, is tough and kids often need extra space time there. And then an extra day uh, attributed to post-secondary planning. Next would be have sort of these pre-packaged online courses through Plato courseware. And so for kiddos who want their space to get elected, that we do not where there wasn't enough space in the classroom, or they're just looking, you know, my kid doesn't have enough to do, what can you help me out? These are sort of really great um, offerings here, and we provide elective credit for kids who successfully complete that. And we have not only sort of a tech support person, but that person is also taking on the extra obligation of doing content area support and tutoring through that program as well. Which program is it? What are you calling that? Uh, Plato. Oh, that's okay. the name of the. So you, yeah, yeah. But so you have there's somebody on staff who helps kids who are enrolled in Plato courses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jessica Cutliff. Yeah. yeah. She's amazing. So I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me, but yeah. what, uh, um, this block five plan, what's the 
chances of getting that changed the timing around a little bit so that the kids that are involved in sports can actually participate in it? So that's a good question. We designed this before sports came back. Um, so that's something that we can look at, Travis. <laughs> but that's a very good point. I'm going to make a note of that. Mm -hmm. Wait to see what color we are tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. it's right. thing. Well, it's constantly changing. But Travis, yeah. thank you for bringing that up. That's good. I mean, already winter, I know they definitely backed up. But I think that's something we'll want to have the mobility to be able to move those times around, depending what is happening with athletics, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. The the uh, pod is way outside of the uh, normal teacher. Do we have any flex time for those teachers that are picking over? Some of it. Joe, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Or? Can someone give me access? Yeah, we're um, paying. You still didn't get it? I Is shared it. The Black Five options? Yes, I shared it. I will, it should be anyone at MS86. Are you in your school account, Denise? I was. OK, I can get it now. OK. Um, so those are, we're not offering so many of our extracurricular things, which typically have stipends to go. We were able to reshuffle some funds to stipend some folks here um, for that. And, and lastly, um, the one that we are still sort of in the design phase, and we had a staff member sort of write her uh, plan for that, I have it on my desk now, is sort of this lecture series thing sort of modeled after um, like what a college had lecture course would be like, special topics, we're going to get a speaker, we're going to read a peer-reviewed article and talk about it as a group. And that also kind of has a social component being set a little further outside of the school day for those kids. And the other reason for these obviously being set outside the school day um, and that we can't place them in it is that the vote kids being able to drive, leave Sanford and get back to the computer, who would want to participate and in that? And non-driving student to, to give bus. them a chance to get home because there isn't a late bus. So we tried yeah. to set it at a time that they would be at home and settle and then could log in. So our hope was to just have a little something more for folks looking for it there. Um, let's see. So that is definitely doable, something we are, again, beginning to do now. The next thing that we are looking to do is on our yellow schedule, those Monday, Tuesdays, increasing the amount of together time. Yeah. We're working on it. <laughs> yes. In one moment. So, and it's not that it matters, but the Black Five one, I can look at the preview, but not open it up. Um, I have a question about the standards recovery. Mm -hmm. How does, how does a, is that something that like kids get identified for that? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So that is a referral-based program where a student can need to recover credit in certain courses because they did not pass the course or pass the standard within a course, are referred by the teacher of that course. And on the referral form, the, the teacher will indicate the areas that need remediation, whether it's linking assignments or other modules, and the standards recovery teacher works through that with the student until they're all set and then their transcript is adjusted to reflect that they earned the credit. And that's, that's really? a program, yeah, that's a program we've really been running for this point. Years. Yeah, no, I mean, I always hear it talked about, but I didn't realize that once, so if, if somebody fails a class, yeah. they can go into this, yes. and prove that they have yeah. whatever, go through whatever process, and then get the credit? Yes. yes. Yep, they don't need to necessarily repeat the entire course. We do not allow them to repeat. And is it, for only certain courses, or is it like just this like English math? Any course that would be required for graduation that they would need it need to fix. Yeah. That, that, sort of I that guess requirement would exist that they would have to, they, they need that credit. That yeah. particular class versus a, it would, like you wouldn't do that if, if it was a, like a, a credit that sort of fell into a bucket of things they needed to check off, but if it was the actual, yeah, like if I right. took gym for the sixth time because I love gym, but I don't need it to graduate, but I didn't do so hot the sixth time because I decided I didn't really want to do it, I, I wouldn't need to recover that, that credit. Okay, it's full. It was already a surplus credit. I guess if someone really wanted to, you, you could give them an opportunity. You just never, never <laughs> asked us. So. Yeah. 
I, you should have access to the other one now. Um, I apologize for that. There was a lot of links here. Um, you might need to refresh. You should. It's open. Yeah, and, and it is working. One version 2.0 yet? Yeah, yeah. 2.0. Can I see it again? Yes. Nice. Okay. So one of the things that we're, we're looking to do is on Monday, Tuesday, we've built a modified version to allow all four blocks to run on those days instead of just two. We feel like kids can handle that increase in time. We also, that allows us to fix that vocational conflict and eliminates the need for teachers to run that extra class section that they're trying to do. And I think it will help the vote kids be less stressed about that conflict. So we're looking to do this next, and we're able to probably do this pretty soon. We just need to meet with our leadership team at school and then walk our staff kind of through that and then just give everyone sort of some forewarning. So again, this plan increases the number of classes kids take on the Monday, Tuesday day from two to four on both days. More together time, synchronous, remote. We think it's just enough that it won't really exacerbate those tech issues that people are having. Um, because much more than this, then we can kind of get into some danger zone of really some issues around equity for kids. Um, but we feel like this is enough that we can still maintain support and give kids a little extra time with their teachers on Monday, Tuesday, and vice versa. And this is doable for everybody, I think, in terms of our staff and all of what they're working through. So that's something we'd like to do. I'll kind of along with that, I'm back on the main document because everything else is the same that you're looking at except the Monday, Tuesday stuff. Is, when are you when are you thinking of trying to implement this? So Travis, we well, we had hoped about doing it at the turn of the quarter, which would be November 7th, but that doesn't give us enough time to meet with our staff because we've got sort of the conference day and we have a staff meeting on Monday, but we wanted to kind of parse this out with our school-based leadership team first. So, but we could probably get this started Thanksgiving time latest. So uh, can I just ask a question yes. about this? So, um, okay. So where previously you would have, um, basically all the blue in the afternoon was not there. Previously. Right. So you would have had, um, Block one, block two, uh, remote on one day. Block three, block four, remote on the next day. Now we've got all of them two days in a row. Yeah. And yes. then, um, so what it, it seems to me what it kind of does is, is takes all of that extended learning, teachers available through Google Meets, email, whatever, and it kind of opens that up to a classroom setting so that if, and do you, and, I mean, I think this is great, but um, do you, I assume that doing this would really help the kids that kind of utilize some of that extra time, but it would also help the kids that needed it but didn't utilize it. I think we think so. Yeah, yeah. Think I think so. so. I think we'll still need certainly some of that other time um, because I do think this will, this will allow teachers to even go, you know, whether it's a little bit deeper or, or cover a little bit more because they're, you know, the typical ninth grade teacher can now be going from two dedicated meeting points in a week up to three. Which, you know, so that's a pretty big increase, even though it's only one day. Um, Say that again? Yeah, so they'd be going from, currently they would touch base, you know, sort of live with their oh, class okay. twice a week. That's going to go from two to three. So I think what it, what it does, it, puts it, it keeps an, a, an okay balance that we feel comfortable with. It doesn't skew things so far to too much synchronous together time, which makes it hard for the, the to and fro vote, the hard for the kids who can't have internet, hard for the kids who are embarrassed to be on the computer at their house because there's a lot of stuff going on. But it, it, it increases that FaceTime, eyeballs eye on time with their teacher just enough, but leave, still leaves space for that asynchronous component, the I need to get extra help from my teacher, the behind the scenes stuff, but I think it puts a, the face to face stuff more in balance a little bit on those two days. Um, but we're still, you can still, there's still some of that teacher work time support time stuff that's available here. And it, it does leave that, it leaves enough time for the teachers to 
We think so. Um, yeah. I think there's still, still what's really important is that we preserve that asynchronous time on their at home days um, to be able to get those more one on ones, get the catch up, to get the oh my gosh, I don't get this. Can we spend two hours on the computer and you help me to stuff? So as long as that stays, we can swing this Monday, Tuesday thing. Um, okay. I'm yep. sorry. I love um, the way this is sort of played out. Uh, are the times like what we're looking at the sort of the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the, um, or I guess it's a bit different, but it, it looks like day one block two, day one block three is during a PE. No, no so that's, that's a separate yeah. kind of those Wednesday, Thursday, Friday run on a completely separate. Those are the in person. Schedule. That's our in person. Those are that, in person. So none of yep. thing, So as far as this schematic goes, just focus on Monday, Tuesday. That's the change. Yeah. Okay. But we are going to improve, I think, how we function on those other days, which is the next part of the I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Trita. I've got a bug out. I'm afraid. I'm sorry to leave the meeting, but um, all of this sounds fantastic. Thank Thanks, Ms. Trader. Sorry. Bye. That's okay. Bye. Bye. Um, so, what we wanted again, so preserving that asynchronous part on um, my at home day or eighth grader is important because they need to be able to check in with teachers and all the other all those other reasons we talked about. But what we find is that some folks don't really know how to use that time at home, or it's not clear what's expected. Right? We get, what's my kid supposed to be doing? Or the kids say. I don't have anything today, and they do. <laughs> and then our, you know, some of our staff, I think, are more clear in articulating to kids and families, like, hey, this is what they're supposed to be doing today, or other folks can have a more flexible style. Um, so what we're gonna try to do is increase the structure in those days. So if I'm an eighth grade kiddo, I'm at home on Wednesday, I should get up and out of bed because my teachers have posted for me on Google Classroom what I'm supposed to be doing that day. I'm going to have a morning check-in through an entrance ticket. Here's what I'm going to do today. At the end of the day, I'm going to submit an exit ticket for all my classes. Here's what I accomplished today. Um, and what we are going to also work on is our teachers, again, making sure they're all saying the same stuff. Here's what is expected of you for my class, and that's a consistent message. I think those two things are really going to help. And then what we're working on, which I put brainstorm, because it's still, it's not straightforward, is for the little guys, which we've identified eight and nine, right, they're struggling the most with some of this stuff, is using a bar or nighttime advisor groups to have a live Google Meet check-in for implementation of interventions or iTime curriculum on that off day for the eighth and ninth graders to start. Because that's been something, I think, for both of those groups that's been hard to implement. Because when you have that one in-person day or two in the case of eighth graders, you're really focused on curriculum. So to say, you know, I'm going to work on social emotional things that the students may need, in some cases, just as much, if not more than, you know, their, their core subject. It's hard to justify sometimes getting that in. This is going to give it a dedicated window for folks and also to increase that touch yeah. point of the what fast what you're gonna implement around that switch are you gonna Yeah, okay, Dr. Back there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is this ticket check in yeah. ticket is is what you are looking to implement around Thanksgiving. Yeah, so well so this yeah, so this kind of is a bundle, right? right. So the yellow two point so the increased class together time on Monday, Tuesday, remote, and then how can we make parents at home understand what their kids are supposed to be doing that day and feel confident that they understand that some of the kids says, oh, they, we know, that's not true, um, kind of a thing, and that teachers are all saying the same thing, which is so, the check-in tickets. The ticket, and so that will, and that will affect attendance as well? So that won't affect attendance necessarily, but what teachers could probably do is tie that into some work habits, mm -hmm. um, the grades work and habits things like that. Grade of the students, I think. But they would be required to create a ticket and an exit. Yeah, the teachers exactly. would be. Yeah, and the kids would be. The expectation would be this is when you get up on your at home day, it's not on Monday, Tuesday, all your teachers have something waiting for you in the Google Classroom. And you communicate back to them. And you understand that you've got some goals. You do an end of the day ticket to you to say, "Hey, here's what I did." And, um, and that the little kids, they have another touch point. So it's about having some structure to the day, having some anchor points to the day, 
So it's not as free flowing, which some people do great with, yeah. others don't. Um, and I'm sorry, did you say the you're implementing that for the eighth and ninth graders or for everybody? That would be so everybody. for everyone. Well, the sort of exit tickets would be for everyone. The that sort of live checking they do the a bar. Um, building assets, reducing risks, program, the icon, that would be for grades eight and nine, because those are the two grades that are participating in that typically. Okay, so, so we're going kind to of scale up model for 10, 11, 12 to have eyeball time, is what we call it, right? So that time kind of face to face, it's just a more complicated model to implement. So we would kind of start here, see how it goes, and then work on phasing um, a scale up. It would be through a revised nighttime program potentially for the other grade levels, but we run into some folk stuff. They're just so in a lot of different directions. Kids but we range. started planning it and then realized it was too complicated <laughs> to talk about in full tonight. So <laughs> this one's the one that we feel really more confident about right now. Yeah, to eight nine. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece that for now the in-person stuff would stay as designed until we really kind of get out of the woods through this winter season and then see what sort of the second semester brings. Um, but I can tell you already, we've already revised the red plan, which we haven't spent a lot of time on, um, but we really increased all the blocks by 15 minutes compared to our original. Let me check the link on this one. I checked it. My Is it good? It, I think so. Okay. Yes. Increased all of our classes by 15 minutes. Um, Originally, we had Wednesday as like a staff day where kids weren't online. We changed that. They're online now all four blocks. Um, and again, we fixed the blocks three and four for the vote conflict there. Because we did that after we saw what Stanford's red plan looked like when they went red. So then we felt confident that we know we know what it is. Let's revise our red now. Um, so we took advantage of that back in September. Um, we never got to do Red 1.0. We were already at Red 2.0. <laughs> we never got Red, but we're ready to go. And we increased class time from Red 1.0. Um, and we'll see how this goes. So I think we've got a good balance on here again of that support time and together time. And it's more together time than 1.0. So <laughs> knock on wood. Hopefully, we'll never have to use this. You have 2.0 ready to go. Snow days. Here we are. Is so it like, it's, uh, it's on the agenda for next week. Yeah, we'll talk about it next week. We'll talk about it Thursday, just we, because it's this is a one agenda. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I do actually have one other question about that sort of falls into the grades category. Um, do we have have we looked at like work habits right now and um, how they fit into the picture? I know they're a bit of a moving target, but if, um, we would need to pull those views separately. But that's a really interesting question. I don't know what to predict because I've heard from teachers. I've had kids completing more work habits assignments than they normally would, and then I've got teachers saying I'm not getting as much work as I normally would. So, so um, yeah. about we can pull those data. We have we have some long-term data on that. Yeah. I mean, it might be worth just looking at the end of the this first quarter or whatever. Mm -hmm. we're yeah. Yes, you definitely do that. Do, Roger, know? do you want to um, go back to Chris? Do he want to make a comment about technology? Yeah, can I just finish what we were yeah. okay. so we can get done this part first? Yeah. Um, so very quickly, the other thing is that we're going to, Ms. Samar in the counseling department is going to take a look at kiddos' schedules that maybe are a little too fluffy um, because how the breakdown was if they had tutorials. Um, when they were here, that would have been no problem, but now it's a tutorial when it's at home, it's weird a little bit. Some kids really need that to reprieve, but I think we're finding that many kids don't. And they were just left on their schedule, so really reaching out to families to say, hey, do you want a class on their schedule instead of this tutorial? Um, might help kids, especially on those at-home days, feel like they've got kind of more of a class vibe. So that's something else we're doing. And then again, um, this is definitely not an extended conversation for tonight, but our focus for second semester is who can we get in a little bit more in person? Because that was clearly what folks are looking to do, but we have to be able to do it safely and in a way that makes logistical sense and doesn't make everyone go cuckoo. That is where we are. Yeah. Oh, so 
for this that you're going to implement for the eighth and ninth graders around Thanksgiving with this ticket check in, ticket check out? Yeah, the tickets would be for everybody. Um, okay. It's just the state for twelve. Yeah, the eight special yeah. Um, bar okay. thing is for eight and nine. Okay. So those, and you said you, you wanted to educate the staff first, then the students. Are we going to be educating the public as well yes. about these new tickets so that parents know to expect? Hey, my child needs to check in on Wednesday and mm -hmm. get yes. a ticket to enter and a ticket to end. Yeah. So they know. Yes, they're absolutely. Supposed to getting it filtered through their student. Yeah. Right. Yes, of course. Yes. So what we probably would do is similar to the letters that we sent out when we said, "Here's yellow. Here's how it will work for your yeah, forward." Question before me. We would send out a letter saying, hey, we've tweaked the yellow plan. Okay. Here's how to look now, just so you know, you can expect your child to be really more in a full class day on Monday, Tuesday. And when they're at home on their at home day, we've added some more structure. Here's what you can expect. Yes. Okay. Travis? Uh, just a clarifying question, and there's a lot of data out there, but are we, is it because it's high school level, it's the six foot, or is it between three and four or four and six and and I, I have a feeling it's i'm confusing elementary versus high school but i'm not positive so the range is three to six we are um at the high school six feet we do consider our high schoolers adults and it is six feet for adults they have big bodies <laughs> some of them so yeah Good okay, with the, the state guidelines saying three to six for students Yes, yes, anywhere in that range. Um, one of the things that we have noticed is with when we have had cases with the six feet, especially in the cafeterias where we know that they need to be at six feet, but we've really done a great job with that. If we feel that if we had been a little closer in contact through the building, through classrooms, um, when we had some identified cases, we could have had more students have cases or potential staff. I think to you at the high school level, in terms of staff safety, feeling safe for the kids being no, they're bigger than most of us, right? Um, the six feet are really important. Here, yep. Computer's about to die. So as you look for like a second semester plan, okay. you're not looking to decrease that six feet at all? Not at this point. Yes. I mean, I think it's yeah. a, it's an ultimately going to be a conversation for the board to think about, but um, the situation that we had just Monday, Tuesday, with within our building, you know, if, if things had been any different in terms of the way things were set up, it would have been a much bigger impact. So it's, it's just those kind of... We're weighing those things out constantly, you know. And with the increases in the county right now, yeah. it doesn't feel like a good time to revisit yeah. cutting that that down to to three or four. Yeah. yeah. I think the staff are feeling pretty confident in the safety measures right now, which I think that we're really lucky that almost all of our staff joined us in person that could, and the ones that can't really can't. Um, I would be concerned if we decrease some of the safety measures that we would be getting some very concerned staff. But something's <laughs> Okay. Chris. Hey, Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I didn't know that about the up and down. Yeah. Thing. And that, yeah, that's every, that's staff, that's, right. we're all struggling with that. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, that was a lot of information. Thank you for yeah. listening to thank our. You. Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for talking. So, can I just make one, one comment? Because I got to observe something, and I'll be really quick today. Is I got a call from my niece who couldn't be at the Lebanon Elementary in the Noble High School to pick up the various kids all at the same time. And I have a night today off. So I said, oh, I'll go to the high school and I'll pick up, I'll pick up back. Great. So um, coming in, I will say the line to come around went pretty smooth. There were people out there. It was, went really well for pickup. Called ahead, said, hey, the yep. horse is going to be picking up. But, you know, I'm leaving and everything. And then I said, okay. So the old kids come out or two. And I, I, I have to say, I was pretty impressed because there was somebody there who literally were making sure that uh, the kids were spread out who were released. And as she was getting in the car, I noticed uh, another young man um, looking for his ride or whatever, and immediately yanked his mask off. And the and I, I apologize, I don't know who it was, but the teacher came right over. You need to keep the mask on until you get in the car, please. And the student put it back on and went looking for whoever. But I just, I thought it was pretty impressive the way that the speed, because I gotta be honest, when I pulled in, <laughs> I was all the way over here. Like, oh my God. When you're on the access road, it can feel wet. Like, I know. It's but, be a while. Yeah, it quick. but the line went pretty quickly. Yeah. And everything Thank you. was orderly. Thank you. And, you know, the kids came out all together as a group. Everyone, yeah. he's like the one student, but yeah. the, the fact that they were caught him right away. Yeah. Yeah. And, but again, it was so smooth. I mean, yeah. it was just quick. And people were expecting, and I was not a regular pickup person. So yeah, they're doing a really nice the head and said, hey, pick up. Thank you. That's uh, music to our ears. So <laughs> for, for that reason, and I will, and the reason I asked the question, so I'll say the next thing. So she jumps in the car. I haven't seen her in quite some time. I said, oh, how was school? She is a, and I, and I filter this through the fact that I know she is a ninth grade girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how was school today? That was good. You know. I said, oh, okay. I said, How, how's things going? Um, good, good. I said, so you're in school how many days? Just today. I only have school on and on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I said, you don't go to school on Thursdays and Fridays? No, those are my days off. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Wait a second here. You can't tell me you don't go to school on Thursdays and Fridays? Yeah. She's like, not as long as I get my homework done. There's right. no reason to there's no reason to go to school. Yeah. And it's something that I said. Tickets so, now. Right? <laughs> we'll take care of that. You got a ticket and check yes. in because yes. I know that her mother is balancing kids at multiple different schools yes. and working. And so she probably is getting that filter to, oh, I don't have any. So, yes, so right. you have to have so get, When you said that, I'm like, oh, okay, now it's <laughs> sense here. Yeah, absolutely. So the check in will be yeah. helpful for yeah. those as well to say, no, you need to check in and yeah. you need yes. to. To focus, yeah, because yeah. she's probably, and you know, sort of. That means she's not going to be in an AP class, but she's she's doing okay. She's yeah. not passing anything. Yeah. So she's in that middle line where, yeah. But it was just she just kind of looked at me quizzically, like, why would I? Say some parties. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Says, yeah. We don't have school in those days. Yeah. So, you do. You are you supposed to be doing something? Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to enjoy this extra structure, but it is good for them. <laughs> so. We will add it. But yeah, thanks for the feedback on the pickups. That was something we didn't know we were going to have like part of our world. I remember the middle school was like, do you guys know there's going to be like a lot of traffic? What are you talking about? We do. We have five grade levels in here. They all go at once. It's fine. Nope. So that was something we've worked through. So yeah, thank you. It was, it was smooth. And, and I got from this end here relatively pretty quickly. And then when I made the turn to go into that parking area, there was somebody down there, you know, saying, you know, find your car, find your car. And kids were going right to the car and they were like, if your student's not out here, please pull over here and wait so we can move the next five cars in. Yeah. And I was like, oh, pretty cool. Yeah. And I was asking that one. Within yeah. five minutes, five, ten minutes. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So I was impressed with that. I did think that was really good. That is mostly thank you out there to Officer Kelker, uh, Mr. Aaron Moore, and Mr. Ross McClellan, our new restorative justice and in-school detention helper, and whatever teachers are assigned on duty out there on those days. We are in here managing the flow before they get out there. But yes, yeah. it takes a. Uh, 
15 people to manage that process. <laughs> so, yeah. I think it's also interesting to watch them go to lunch. They all stand in, the, in their little line, they're six feet apart, they get their food, go walk. It's like they're in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a happy one, it's a happy prison. Good and it's really, I mean, if you had, like six months ago, if you told me we were going to be doing school like this, and we yeah. said you were crazy, but here we are. And yeah. it, it still hits me. I'll walk into school and I'll see the kids getting off the bus with masks on, and it's just so surreal. It doesn't, it just. Well, I'd just like to say that I, I, this is not the way education is supposed to be. I think we're all realizing how right. important right. being person to person is. Yes. yes. And we're doing the best, and you guys definitely are doing the best you can. And I would just say, if any parents don't think that kids are getting challenged, they need to contact the teachers. Yes. I mean, I think the check-in thing will help when, when you get to that. But I mean, this is an impossible situation that we've made work. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think the they parents and really well. the community yeah. needs to understand how, how difficult this has been, not just for the families, yeah. but for this whole yeah. education department. You know, it's just not yeah. been great. Yeah. But if you've got questions, we can. Yeah, if you've got questions you can't answer because they're so hyper specific, that's okay. And we can answer the hyper specific questions, is what we're here for. So, you know, encourage folks to reach out to us and reach out to the teachers first. Most of those things can be solved by just saying, hey, a kid sitting there not doing anything, or you know, feel challenged and they're bored, or they're overwhelmed, and I need a modification or a workload. Like, we do those things all the time, we say no. Right. But that's harder for you guys to, to, right. to manage. Yeah, that's not your thing. Yeah. So, yeah. I certainly yeah. appreciate uh, all the work that you guys have done, and I don't know how you do it, but I would have been a case. Well, <laughs> yeah, I would second that. And I, I mean, the, the feedback that I've heard from students, like your niece, was it? Yeah. I mean, they're kind of like, yeah, it's good. It's fine. Yeah. Like, they're, they, yeah. They've been out late right now. Well, they yeah. stayed in school a lot of them. They're really yeah, I think they miss it. I think they appreciate the work that's it's being done. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't seem, I don't think they care one way or the other about who they eat lunch with. You know, I mean, I think they used to think they did, but. Um, yeah. So I think they are pretty flexible on like some of the sacrifices. Um, but I do, I think that they, I think they miss the FaceTime. And I do think that the extra, I mean, what you guys are proposing will take a giant leap towards, yeah. I, I just think there's a lot of kids, one of the notes that I had, um, which I think this will kind of answer was like, can we rethink how kids ask for support? Because yes. it is so hard. A kid that even is, is comfortable asking for support probably doesn't need it as much as all the kids who like yeah, need yeah. it and can't yes. ask for it. Like that's part for sure. one of the reasons they need support yes. or help is because they can't ask for it. So, I mean, I would, that's one of the things I was going to put to you guys. Can we rethink what that looks like. Yes. You can't, what, what I've experienced is that like you, a kid can't email a question because they can't articulate it because they stand the question. Right. It, and then so they just, and all of that takes about a second for them to decide. Not. Oh. Oh. No. Um, so I, I yes. think um, I, I do think the new schedule is going to help a ton. Yeah. But I do think we have to keep that in mind too. Like we were talking about that a lot today. Actually, we were talking about this the bar eight nine bar thing. Maybe we can move it to scale up eventually to a ten eleven twelve night time thing. Um, that that person can help facilitate that. Because what we know is that if students show up in the class, they, they tend to not then make an appointment for themselves right. to meet with sure. their teacher. They don't know how to advocate for themselves. And, yeah. right. and that's some we teachers. We work with that at grades eight and nine, and that's really part of the Building Assets Introducing Risk program, is you have teachers who are looking at kids' grades every single week, and then we come together on Mondays, we have big block meetings, and we're meeting. So we're meeting remotely because we're not here, but we're meeting with all the teachers, all the counselors, identifying the kids who are in trouble, and then reaching out to those kids to ensure that they're getting the help they need, and also helping them to develop those skills because learning how to self-advocate is a life skill. Mm -hmm. So all of those pieces together are really a big part of the puzzle. We Obviously, we can do more of that when we're here in person um, and figure out how to navigate that when sometimes the help has to happen remotely.
remotely has been really a challenge because kids don't want to see their face on the camera or don't feel uncomfortable just being with their teacher. And it's weird. They're in their room, the teachers in whatever, their kitchen, or yeah. it's, it's a whole strange dynamic. Like you were saying, they don't even know how to ask for help. They just say, I don't get it. Exactly. Right. And it's like, okay, what do you get? I yeah. just don't get it. Yeah. Right. You know, and they don't. No. Exactly. You're right there beside them and you see them doing it. Right. right. And we do those meetings um, 8 through 12, which is called something different, 10 through 12. Um, but we're definitely not in a position where we say, well, a kid needs to ask for help, you know, we have, but we need to make sure that all staff are approaching that outreach the same way. So we have a student who's not passing your class. Have you called home? Have you checked in one on one with that student to say what's going on? Have you made an appointment? With them, knowing that the most will not request to make an appointment with right. you. So it's about reiterating those expectations at really every week during these meetings to make sure that those things are happening. Um, and I think that we can do more to make sure it's happening as a school because we have a number of folks who are part of these teams. These are for our core teams. So we've got a number of staff who don't do those meetings. So that would be a good staff meeting topic to say, hey, reminder, kids probably aren't going to be making appointments with you. So Invitation is going to go the other way around. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys um, thinking outside of the box, considering everything, and reinventing. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the high school administrative team has done a tremendous job. Uh, I mean, it's yeah. it's just so clear when you look through all this. But even just sitting in the meetings this summer that we've had, and just everything that's going on you know this is just a portion of of what had to happen um to get the building open and yeah. tremendous tremendous job and tremendous work thank you thank you wish we could do more it's just hard you know yeah. well i mean we've we've had this we've had to adjust our priorities in terms of like in person for our younger kids because we know that that's going to impact that yeah. long term and so you guys have done a fabulous job and if you look at it from way more in march where you were in May. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. To where you are now. I mean, this is completely different than yes. when we had to just, everybody just left. Yep. You know? So, yep. Yep. But but flexibility is going to be the name of the game for a yep. while. Fingers yeah. crossed, though, hopefully we're not in this next year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We don't have that discussion tonight. But no. like, we're already thinking about it this year. Okay. <laughs> One month at a time. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. true. Uh, All right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you guys. You. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, I'm closing all of